The title of this program is Gurdjieff's Implantation. This is John Amaral. Abstract. The Alpha and Omega of the Tales, Meetings, Life is Real, and Herald is Gurdjieff's implantation into humanity requiring our urgent response. The sole means now for the saving of the beings of the planet Earth would be to implant again into their presences a new organ, an organ like Kundabuffer, but this time of such properties that every one of these unfortunates during the process of existence should constantly sense and be cognizant of the inevitability of his own death as well as the death of everyone upon whom his eyes or attention rests. Only such a sensation and such a cognizance can now destroy the egoism completely crystallized in them that has swallowed up the whole of their essence and also that tendency to hate others which flows from it. The tendency, namely, which engenders all those mutual relationships existing there which serve as the chief cause of their abnormalities, the unbecoming to three brain beings, and maleficent for them themselves and for the whole of the universe. The Tales, page 1183. The soul means now for the saving of mankind, devised by Gurdjieff, which he recommends to his endlessness via Beelzebub on the last pages of the Tales, is a new organ implanted in us by the reading, as if allowed, of his specially constructed writing and the trying and fathoming the gist of it. Like Kundabuffer, it is implanted, but not genetically. Instead, it is implanted hypnotically in the location he characterizes as a cogitative lora, a special group of cells in our brain where it has the quality of permanently reminding us that we and all we gaze upon or contemplate will die. As we examine Gurdjieff's transformationally shifting treatment of death throughout his four publications, from family to friends to significant others to all others, we see an unbroken black thread examined from and reinforced by many perspectives. Our personalized awareness of this black thread is his primary antidote for the infectious crimson thread, war, from which mankind is in peril. This fact may be a paramount reason why younger people often have a tough time approaching Gurdjieff work, since death is normally less of a concern for them, so it is up to the more seasoned listeners and viewers of this program. This is why we have been instructed to read Gurdjieff linearly thrice in a sequential reinforcement of his method. Prologue Gurdjieff began an objectively impartial criticism of the life of man in 1924 with urgency born of a great knowledge of the past and a great concern for the future of humanity. The future peril he saw is at a critical mass today. It's time for each of us to seriously begin to confront it. Firstly, digesting and acquiring a realistic perspective on the whole of all and everything. Secondly, understanding and practicing Gurdjieff's antidotes. Thirdly, actively promoting Gurdjieff's implantation for our own good and the good of all upon whom our attention rests. At the end of the tales where Hussein's question encompasses all of Beelzebub's experience, including the reason for his insurrection and forced exile, there is a fundamental puzzle, truth, and meaning in Beelzebub's answer to both his endlessness and Hussein that must apply and relate directly to us. In one of his most Gurdjieffian dog-burying gestures, rather than to simply propose his remedy near Beelzebub's banishment, Gurdjieff's, Gurdjieff interpolates between the extremes of chapters 2 and 27 the very lengthy and complex entirety of the first series and reinforces this theme in the depths of his three subsequent publications. In the entirety of the tales, Gurdjieff asserts that, although they are complementary for an inner development, all the methods of the prophets, Muhammad, hope, Buddha, reason, Lama, faith, Christ, love, Moses, being, laws, Ashiata, conscience, and the interventions recounted in his Six Descents to Earth of Beelzebub fail to enduringly eliminate the destructive consequences of Kundabuffer. At the end of the tales, he doesn't recapitulate all that. He simply says, the soul means. 
Plan of this program if viewed by a group. 20 minutes of exposition, 10 minutes suggested for group discussion, 5 minutes of resolution, and questions of each other in the time remaining. Gurdjieff's doubly, triply urgent message and directive. How many of us routinely experience annoyance, hatred? How many of us are able to avoid their expression? Taking violent politics and unbridled technology into account, we can hardly doubt that humanity is in danger of extinction or assimilation or a boot. Gurdjieff asserts that this is a result of daily actions by each of us with respect to one particular factor. Such a powerful factor should concern us personally, socially, and spiritually, because we can hardly doubt that such reboots have happened in the past. There are many ancient structures on earth, some in plain sight, whose origins, purpose, and creation we know little or nothing about, and which we could not duplicate today. Due to scientific thinking beginning with Egyptian ideas, 3000 BC, the Renaissance, 1400, science fiction such as Flatland, 1620, Gulliver's Travels, 1726, Frankenstein, 1816, From the Earth to the Moon, 1850, and Beelzebub's Tales, 1933 and 1950, modern harnessing of the invisible electromagnetic world since 1875, coinciding with the birth of Gurdjieff and the publishing of Maxwell's Equations, 1946 when Forrestal took 13 ships and 3,700 men to Antarctica, and 1950 coinciding with the publication of the Tales and when telescopes began to assure us of thousands of potentially life-bearing planets, our concern takes on an undeniable triple urgency as a consequence of accelerating sorry science. Humanity may be no more or less warlike than ever, but that can be debated. What cannot be debated is that the world is more dangerous than ever, because unreasonable outlier personalities with access to weapons can trigger widespread devastation on a whim, and nature also imposes hostilities. The danger includes physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual threats. All could be greatly mitigated by a mutually cooperating, well-connected, evolving, communicating humanity. Gurdjieff began all and everything in 1924 at age 52 with double urgency born of a great knowledge of extinct civilizations and triple concern for the future of humanity. And it was fundamentally completed ten years later just as he was losing the priory. One might surmise with the greater part of his attention on writing, he sacrificed his home. The frame story of the tales established in chapters 2 and 47 pivots on Beelzebub's exile and his endlessness's question to the pardoned Beelzebub as he returned to the source of his arising. But he doesn't tell us precisely the objection that led to his insurrection and banishment. The question and Beelzebub's answer encapsulates Gurdjieff's solution to a hazardous created universe with free will and our predicament living on oars, the ass end of the universe. Gurdjieff's prime directive can be found in the penultimate paragraph, that if human life on earth is to be saved from extinction, we must be made to at all times remember that we and all others are going to die. Only with such a constant nullification of our sense of egoistic immortality may war be eliminated. Gurdjieff tweaked the tales for another 16 years and was practically on his deathbed in 1949 before releasing it for major publication. Considering the technological developments of modern warfare and communications during the preceding 100 years, the 1947 publication of In Search and the newspaper accounts of Forrestal's U.S. military expedition to Antarctica in search of alien or German war machines, Gurdjieff knew that he had waited as long as he could to launch his flying cathedral as an implantation within humanity. Today, the need to understand, internalize, and spread Gurdjieff's prime directive requires our urgent response. This paper is concerned with fathoming the gist of Gurdjieff's fundamental aim and putting his antidotes into perspective. 
Fathoming the gist with respect to death. Beelzebub's answer to his endlessness in the last chapter of the frame story is quoted by Anna Challenger as the sole means now for the saving of the beings of the planet Earth would be dot 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 if every one of those unfortunates during the process of existence should constantly sense and be cognizant of the inevitability of his own death as well as of the death of everyone upon whom his eyes or attention rests. So specifically, Anna has omitted the phrase to implant again into their presences a new organ, an organ like Kunda buffer, but this time of such properties that. Focusing on her omission, we are reminded that Beelzebub has prescribed another implantation. Consider that the first one, Kunda buffer, did not go so well. It was removed, yet its terrible consequences remained. She and we tend to overlook this confounding declaration. Do I routinely experience annoyance, hatred? Do I attempt to avoid their expression? How does hatred arise? As a practical matter, what is the true arising of hatred? During his second to last meeting, Dr. Keith Buzzle provided a shock by reminding us that Beelzebub's response is not the end of the tales. Gurdjieff reserved his last paragraph to declare that the answer to his great question about the peril of our extinction, the cause of war, is hatred driven by egoism. Confronting my own inner considering, I've been repeatedly reminded of how easy it is to forget these simple facts. How can I remember that annoyance, egoism, and hatred are all related in me? That my annoyances are, in fact, egoism, which is the beginning of hatred. In his book, Perspectives, pages 88 to 90, Dr. Buzzle gives an example of the progression of annoyance to hatred and past it to the objectification and indifference common in our bigoted society which leads to war. I want to understand hatred, and this has taken me on a strange journey. Focusing attention on it, it appears to be negated by Gurdjieff's formulation, only he may enter here who puts himself in the, pos himself in the position of the other results of my labors. If I do that well, it is difficult or impossible to feel annoyance with or hatred of others. Early on, Gurdjieff formulated external considering as a practice which requires me to listen better. How often do I experience annoyance, hatred? Am I often unable to avoid their expression? Implantations in general. Implantations into each of our three brains may be inherited, conditioned, deduced, or engineered through genetics, DNA, RNA, epigenetics, gene expression, sensations, for example, muscle memory, feelings, for example, music, or thinking, for example, metaphors in the tales. Gurdjieff uses the word in half quotes but specifies a location. I feel it's time we dropped the half quotes. Implantations in the first and second brains are discussed in sections 7D, 7E, and 7F appended to this program. So if the idea that implantations can take all the forms in the previous paragraph seems new or extreme, please take a few minutes to consider this material at the end. The concept of a range of possible implantations is essential for understanding how the consequences of Kunda buffer lead to hatred and war. Now we can look at Gurdjieff's implantation. Gurdjieff's implantation into the third brain, the hypnotic implantation of the remembrance of death in all and everything, composed of the tales, meetings, life is real, and herald. In previous papers, we explored Gurdjieff's use in his writing of suggestibility, hypnotic induction, anchors, the subconscious, and now the cogitative Laura. One reviewer's skepticism was helpful. It made me investigate the linear vector of death throughout all of A&E, not just the tales. From his grandmother, to his sister, to Oraj, a definite sequence of hypnotically implanted generational relationships which go from self to other in focus. In two enigmatic paragraphs from Harold, 
Gurdjieff describes how his own implantation came about and how he learned the method he employed in his writing. The Herald of Coming Good, page 14, Surefire Press Edition. Although I, too, at that period of my life, resembled them in my outward manifestations, since I was as much a product as they were of the same abnormal conditions of environment, yet thanks to the circumstance that I was in my nature, since childhood, already possessed, through the deliberate inculcation of both my father and my first tutor, of certain data permitting the development of my individuality by the time of my responsible age, among several other very original inherent traits of this peculiar trait of inevitable impulse and striving to understand the very essence of any object that attracted my attention out of the ordinary. In A&E, Gurdjieff recounts in vivid detail and implants by hypnotic induction a series of deaths that become gradually farther from the self of the reader. The death of his grandmother and her admonition to him in the first chapter of the tales, the encounters with death by his hero Beelzebub, his dear sister's death, and getting shot in meetings. In Life is Real, the grave accounts of the deaths of his mother and wife, and his reaction to the death of his spiritual brother Oraj. These and the many deaths in between, for example, the dogs caught by the dog catcher, Abdul, his father, the near death of himself and Karpenko on the firing range, father of Lisi, the Gornak, Pogassian, Prince Lubavetsky, etc., install a definite, subtle progression of kin, teachers, collaborators, and so on, leading to the young Hussein, his future substitute, implying that Beelzebub and Gurdjieff themselves will die. They encourage the reader to identify with and internalize his or her awareness of death as inevitable. A&E is not normal literature. Its structure and operation as a teaching machine is personal throughout. If one may be tempted to debate how effective this process might be, I think we have to have much more respect for the power of hypnosis to implant an idea. There are few processes so naturally powerful. Considering this, a question might be how to inspire people to read. Gurdjieff initiates the desire through some reverse psychology in the entertaining first chapter of the tales by repeatedly suggesting that reading is not for everybody, and with regard to Harold by suggesting that we might be better off not reading it. In Harold, as he did with Kundabuffer, he again uses the special word something in half quotes to describe how such a reminding factor was installed in him by an important death. The Herald of Coming Good, page 15. There began to form in my thoughts, gradually, and even in a way imperceptible to my waking consciousness, the something which assumed definition soon after a spiritual tribulation caused by the death of an intimate friend, and this newly formed datum of my mind has begun ever since upon contact with the so-called cogitative Laura, the product usually of the frequent repetition of certain defined and automatically current associations in man's mind, to engender in my entirety what I have elsewhere termed as irrepressible striving. Cogitative means thoughtful. And Collins' English Dictionary explains the meaning of Laura as in the medieval Christian church, a group of monastic cells in a desert area where reclusive monks lived. In plain words, cogitative Laura is an implantation through thought in a group of isolated brain cells specialized as a reminding factor, both figurative and literal. This was sometimes referred to by Mr. Nyland as being in the frontal lobes and represented by the breasts of a virgin in the Akaldan symbol, in this case reminding about death. My own grandparents, I now realize, had such a reminding factor cemented by the death of their eight-year-old daughter when they were just 25. Perhaps my father, when he was 22, had it also, like many who returned from Germany and Japan after World War II. What beans does war serve? The following must be articulated just right and understood as best we can. 
Despicably, at our level, which is sometimes designated as World 48, war is not only lucrative business for a small number of dynastic human families. According to Gurdjieff, it releases experiential energy he calls Askokan, in a large quantity necessary for the maintenance of creation, when we do not work on ourselves. How is this energy transformed, and by whom? In the transformation of the materialities of the ray of creation, what is it that eats the higher bodies of man? We really do not know, but we can see that it is necessary in general for creation. How can we begin to understand the archangels above man in Gurdjieff's diagram of everything living found in In Search of the Miraculous? Is our digestive elimination of ego required for the development of reason and the inevitable transformation of identity related to what the persuasive young Beelzebub saw that got him steamed and exiled. What did Beelzebub see as a youth that he considered wrong? Gurdjieff's literary hero Beelzebub in his youth had the impetuousness to find fault with creation. It must have been over something significant such that he could convince others and cause an insurrection reminiscent of the biblical story of the war and banishment of half the angels. At the end of the tales, one interpretation of his prescribing another implantation would be that there is still something wrong and he is still nervy enough to mention it directly to his endlessness. Was it reciprocal feeding or is it simply that his, the unforeseenness of hazard requires periodic intentional correction. What's the lesson for we creatures who supposedly have free will? We too have unforeseen hazards, a lot of them, which like Gurdjieff's bullets, require reason-based corrections. There's a definite cheekiness in Beelzebub's suggestion that another implantation be made, since the first was a catastrophe for the poor three-brained beings of Earth with an effect upon them of destruction like the trumpets of Jericho in full blast. That we are going to die is a microcosmic shadow of his endlessness's realization that the place of his existence was gradually diminishing. There is a certain ironic injustice that all beings must die so that his endlessness may live, so that all possibilities for his existence may be worked out reconciling the merciless Herapaths. Again, to what did Beelzebub object? And did his position change? So what did he see and how did it change for him? Was it hazard or something else? Bennett points out the necessity for hazard in order that all possibilities may be realized and Buzzle points out that, due to hazard, his endlessness himself does not know the answer to his question to Beelzebub in chapter 47. Should we expect that corrective factors must always be periodically employed, without which our continued existence cannot be maintained? Or can we transcend this fate by internalizing Gurdjieff's method? In making his recommendation of a new implantation, Beelzebub encapsulates a lot. He is accepting that hazard is a fact of life in our unpredetermined universe, that the correction of unforeseen hazard will be periodically necessary, and suggesting or remonstrating that his endlessness be more forthcoming about the inevitability of death in his universe. It follows that his endlessness owes a debt of, to life for dying, that he may live. If we adopt this point of view, how can we not think that this is the subject that got the youthful Beelzebub to revolt. The subject is also echoed in Gurdjieff's preoccupation with the cause of war. A reviewer of this paper asked whether implantation replaces the way. I think not. In my view, Gurdjieff has identified because of hazard, there will always be a need for a mechanical corrective factor to be implanted, but it does not replace the way which reveals the need for correction to a few. 
Those who see the need for a new corrective factor are responsible for implanting it by the means available to them, as Gurdjieff has done. We can recall his many wishes, plans, hopes, etc. he made for us to enable the penetration of his obje an objectively impartial criticism of the life of man. He summarizes these plans and hopes in Herald. Group Discussion Having set the stage, what ideas and perspectives might qualify as the young Beelzebub's objection? Here are four categories which we might consider. First category, the force need to create the universe. One, reconciling the Herapas. Autoegocrat versus trogo autoegocrat. Two, etherocrylno. Is the great ray of creation an incomplete solution to Herapas? Three, do the polarized archangels Lucifer, light, and Michael, mass, related as E equals MC squared, represent the created universe? Does their separation and famous angel-devil war represent inevitable conflict as the extreme opposites of self-other consideration and cooperation? Four, everything is suffering. Second category. You can't win. Number five, Chuk God Latanical, is purgatory a dead end? Third category, reciprocal feeding. Six, reciprocal feeding requires the death of the consumed. Seven, Luiso's fear that humans might realize that the purpose of human life on earth is to feed higher beings and therefore destroy themselves. See the diagram of everything living in In Search of the Miraculous. Fourth category, the hazard of independent automatic moving. This hazard says archangels are uncreative perfectionists who make mistakes requiring correction. Luiso seems to know this when he asks Beelzebub for assistance. Is the need for correction a deal breaker? Recapitulation and resolution. How Gurdjieff wants to be repaid. As we look around our enlarging world, there is considerable evidence of prior technologically superior civilizations that vanished. With only a little thought, we can see it could happen to us. Do we care about the fate of humanity? How has Gurdjieff provided for this? Annoyance is such a small thing. How could it lead to war? The circular letter at the end of Herald is essential for our understanding of how to fulfill our obligation to Gurdjieff. It reveals his state of mind about the importance of what he brought to humanity and calls on all who have met him on the ground of his ideas to further his aim of widespread distribution to endeavor to save the three brain beings of planet Earth. Gurdjieff's plan for distribution. Although he intentionally delayed publication of the first series, The Tales, until he was dying, he did not leave the translating, printing, and distribution of it to chance. Having lived at a time when it might have seemed inconceivable that physical books would not always be valued, greatly, and available, Gurdjieff apparently expected that bookseller sales of the first series, The Tales, would be substantial and best handled by professionals while placing the responsibility of distributing the second and third series on his followers, which now includes us as having met him on the ground of his ideas. In the circular letter, Gert Gurdjieff outlines what seems to be a naive plan to require booksellers of the tales to fill in and post the blanks in Herald to the corresponding center for the spreading of my writings. Yet he does not seem to have taken pains to assure the existence of such a center other than in his near deathbed instructions to a few individuals. Nor did he ensure that the booksellers would have copies of Herald containing the blanks or outline how they would acquire the data to fill them out. Confusing? Puerile? Was this enough? 
Well, here we are. As I read the circular letter, Gurdjieff reiterates that he wants and requires as repayment of our debt to him the free dissemination of his writing, because it is mainly beyond his earthly control due to having himself attended to teaching rather than business, and it is nevertheless now solely our responsibility and legally possible for it to be so. To be completely accurate, he places emphatic financial expectation on the tails but not the value and cost of distribution of the second and third series. Regardless of what has been said or what we think about Harold and Gurdjieff's seeming relative inattention to distribution, his instructions in the circular letter appended to Harold are clear. He spends a good deal of time in it and the main of Harold, convincing us about our debt to him and that our repayment of the debt is to be the distribution of the second and third series of his writings, possibly without charge. To underscore his position, he places a very specific retail price on the Tales and Herald, omitting prices for the second and third series. Moreover, the Tales price is high enough that it could never be a bestseller, but sufficient that regular sales could defray the cost of distributing the balance of his writing. This seems quite intentional. We note that the typical charge for the tales these days is around 25% of Gurdjieff's instruction of 200 francs, whereby he seems to have targeted a royalty to be in the neighborhood of $20 to $40. This amount would have generated sufficient income to freely distribute the second and third series. Rather than focusing on how these numbers might need to change today, let's note the more important principle that sales of the tales should support distribution of the second and third series. If we agree with Gurdjieff about the urgency of enabling Beelzebub's suggestion to his endlessness and accept that his writing is the implantation he prescribes, it has become our obligation to do what we can to implant his message in the entirety of mankind. The means are all around us. We can take the aim individually and as a group to use whatever means are at our disposal to make his writing available according to his wishes, such as with the powerful new methods of distribution. Perhaps there is an organization of congenial individuals bold enough to seriously support such an initiative. Paul Beekman Taylor wrote, as for the copyright on Gurdjieff's work, as of January 2020, his work is open to all. Four calls to action for groups and individuals. One, take the initiative to ensure that Gurdjieff's writing is always easily available. Two, this seems like a good opportunity to encourage support of the Golden Rule Project, uh, which is at thegoldenruleproject.org. The Golden Rule is an exercise in self-implantation of its many worldwide formulations, including two of Gurdjieff's own, the inscription over the door to purgatory and the prayer he asks to be inscribed on his father's gravestone. Three. The piano game is iPad software which teaches a person, without reading, to emulate performances chosen from a library of 4,000 songs which cover the history of music in the West. The pianist becomes for a time the embodiment of the composer, his era, his culture, his feelings, his sensitivity. Such a skill involves the willing self-implantation of these factors and contributes to emotional and intellectual flexibility. With the piano game, you can learn the music you want, including Gurdjieff movements and Gurdjieff to Hartman compositions. The point of the self-implantation of these skill factors is so that individuals may better put themselves into the place of others, which is a fundamental requirement for reducing war. It is felt that a quantum shift of plus 3% in the number of musicians in the world, in addition to raising general consciousness, would have a demonstrable chaotic effect towards disrupting the war machine. Be a part of the 3%. Number four. Purchase and use a Gurdjieff primer and curriculum. 
Profits from the purchase are plowed back into advertisement and distribution. 5. Take personally the grassroots word-of-mouth distribution campaign outlined by Gurdjieff in Herald in the form of seven registration blanks. Personally invite seven of your friends and acquaintances to purchase the curriculum. Simply begin by adding a personal note to the Gurdjieff curriculum email and send it to your possibly interested friends. Please CC the curriculum return address so they can be added to the mailing list. Appendix Gurdjieff's Implantation into the Second Brain and its Implication The origin of the name Beelzebub derives from Baal, the lord of all that flies, the Assyrian god of the atmosphere, where Gurdjieff says, everything happens. Here flows air, containing the second brain's food, whose higher components include speech, music, and song. We're reminded that Gurdjieff advises reading the tales as if aloud, that the Gurdjieff to Hartman music inspires definite familiar moods evocative of people, places, and emotional states, some transcended, that the DeHartman music for movements assists us to align centers, that musicians self-implant these factors by playing and often memorizing such pieces. While there are many emotional confrontations in his writing and music which serve to reconcile the first and third brains, we should particularly note how Gurdjieff movements which engage and challenge the whole of a person's three brains and cement understanding of the teachings can implant the experience of three-centeredness. The implantation of Kunda buffer into the first brain. To be reminded just how much Kunda buffer concerns the first brain, reread in Beelzebub's Tales, pages 88 to 90, beginning with the sacred members and ending with began to be crystallized in their presences. But what was the nature of the organ? They made a something grow in the three brain beings there in a special way at the base of their spinal column at the root of their tail. Pre-hominids who swung through trees millions of years ago lost their tails as they descended from the trees and began to have upright postures walking around. The five lowest vertebrae fused into a tailbone, sacrum, through which spinal nerves thread in the pelvis and down the legs. Some of these nerves manage bipedal locomotion, intestinal elimination, and sexual movement. Near this base, the soft tissue contains the gonads, where DNA and RNA are prepared for conception. As they began to walk on land upright, their new spine and pelvis alignment became supported by longer quadriceps and stronger hamstring muscles to dynamically balance the spine against the force of gravity and static magnetism of the earth, creating a polarity between hips and head, increasing the flow of life energy up the spine, greatly increasing sexual activity as an emotional expression elimination boosting the energy of the second and third brains, developing a substantial neocortex and frontal lobes, and increasing the expressive output of the third brain, all working together to create the possibility of spiritual development. They began to look up at the stars and consider their origins out there. Recent discoveries have pointed to small hominid groups in multiple locations on Earth, but the curiously compressed fossil record has inspired the search for a famous evolutionary missing link. There is strong evidence in the fossil record. This brings us to emphasize the origin of Homo sapiens when the cranium was enlarged. Explorer Michael Tellinger makes a good case that a jump in the fossil record to Homo sapiens around 200,000 years ago happened in a very compact area with insufficient time to be accounted for by Darwinian selection. This suggests it may have been genetically engineered, a genetic implantation. 
There is more, and it's worth investigating in the links below. Is it reasonable to believe that genetic modification could have precise psychological consequences? No matter, because however Cundibuffer was implanted, certain odd inventions have persisted for a very long time, at least 200,000 years. The location associated with this jump is South Africa, where there are gold mines and native legends of their enslavement mining gold using elephants as pack animals. On top of this, there are plenty of adjacent legendary carvings, ancient artifacts, gold and cinnabar, that's mercury, mines around the world. Early Third Brain Implantations Were the following ideas genetically implanted or planted by culture? Does it matter? Can we see the upside-downness of the following? Gold is valuable. Until recently in electronics, gold had little utility. Why has its value seemingly been always far in excess of utility for a very long time? How was this idea implanted? Such ideas as gold is valuable, a gold standard denotes quality, are familiar implantations. Yet gold has not had utility until modern solid-state electronics, so why has it been of strong interest along with other non-useful derivatives of gold, such as money. A relationship between gold and money was formed a long time ago. Money is an abstraction for trade issued by the state, often represented historically by a fixed amount of gold until the invention of paper money. Further abstraction has allowed interest to be placed on money, representing the opportunity cost to the lender of not being able to spend his money. The Christian Gospel parable of the talents contains a reference to interest. Sexual, tribal, and cultural taboos also seem implanted. What ends do taboos serve? Such rules ensure the proliferation of genetic traits as wide as possible. At the same time, they provide a basis for automatic binary first brain survival regarding self and other, such as potential mate, impossible mate, friend, foe, food, poison, safe, dangerous, sheltered, vulnerable, etc. Money and the need for it is often linked to a process of hypnotic enslavement to wage war as a generator of increased wealth for non-combatants. There is a direct empirical evidence of this in that the world money supply, which is the amount of cash in circulation, has been directly correlated with the instance of war in the world. Federal reserves, local to individual countries, have sprung up in the last 150 years to regulate their money supplies, which is a driver of arms production and sales. The situation can almost not be undone, except by an extinction and reboot. A familiar example is that great gobs of weapons have been sold into the Middle East, causing mass migrations. After devastation in the home countries, some entities stand to profit from cleaning up and providing a newly imposed order in the form of replacement construction. Gurge of Soul Means is one of the few effective monkey wrenches we monkeys can throw into the gigantic meshed gears of the war machine. While we know it is difficult, we can choose to remember our own deaths and that of others and in the process transform hatred. But let's be realistic about this process and find a way to promote it.